Good evening and welcome to the Board of Education meeting for um, tonight, October 6, 2016. May I have the attendance, please? Mrs. Bailey? Mrs. Blyford? Here. Mrs. Massengill? Here. Dr. Miles? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Hobbs? Would you join me in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Do we have any adjustments to the agenda? There are no adjustments to the agenda. Okay, are there any members of the public here that would like to speak on any agenda item? If you could please state your name and address and you have three minutes. Oh, uh, Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive. Uh, good evening. I see one of our agenda items is um, the uh, contract, teacher contract. And so we're just a few months into the year, but I think this is certainly one of the biggest decisions, discussions that you're going to make for the school year because come around next, uh, uh, next spring, we'll be talking about, oh, this is just a contracted service item. So I hope, based on what I've heard on other discussions of, of other contracts, I hope we get an in-depth discussion about it tonight, an in-depth presentation, and some good questions from the board here. Uh, you folks really do a good job, I think, on, on, on policies and so forth. Spend a lot of good time and come up with good ones. And I hope, uh, I hope the budget, or I hope this contract also gets a good discussion. I'd like to know, certainly, how much is it increasing? You know, what's the average increase for the teachers? How much is the budget going to be impacted? Is it going to go up a million bucks, two million dollars? Just some basic financial information, I hope, comes out tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And I will tell you, if we don't, um, if that information doesn't come out tonight, just because we might not have all of it prepared, um, we are asking the superintendent to do a full analysis for our next meeting of the financial impacts and programmatically. So if you don't get your answers tonight, they could be coming next in our next meeting. Okay. Um, superintendent's report, 6.0. So I wanted to um, just take a moment. We're one month into the school year and give everyone an enrollment update. Our current enrollment is 2,970 students in all of our schools combined. Currently at the high school, we have um, 997 high schoolers. At the middle school, there are 716 students. Um, at Wentworth, we have 670 students. At Blue Point, we have 191 students. Eight Corners Primary School, 223 students. And Pleasant Hill, we have um, 173 students. And looking at enrollment history um, from last year at this time, we had 2,986 students. So um, a slight decrease in enrollment of 16 students from this time last year um, to this time this year. And this is as of October 1. So the reality is that the enrollment could be different today, <laughs> give or take a few students. I also at this time wanted to ask Joanne Sizemore to give us an update on our recent substitute job fair that we had. Sure. Um, for, on Saturday, um, we had joined forces with uh, Gorm, Westbrook, and South Portland school systems, and we held a job fair for all substitute positions, teachers, ed techs, uh, bus drivers, custodians, um, secretarial positions, food service, and it was held at Hudson University out on Spring Street, and we were delighted to have 110 uh, people show up in two hours, and so it was a huge success. Um, we're doing a, uh, a presentation to the Cumberland <coughs> County superintendents about it because it's the first time any group of uh, schools have done a job fair like this, and uh, so we were really um, delighted with uh, processing people to complete an application. We had laptops so they could get on with the state to do their fingerprinting and uh, get that paperwork done. And we had thought we would, would be able to do the uh, mandatory trainings, but we were so overwhelmed in the two hours. Mm -hmm. um, we had 16 people conducting interviews with them. And um, so we're lo uh, looking forward to now meeting the people and having them come in for payroll and so forth. So it was a huge success, and if we get 40 more substitutes out of it, 
It's huge. Um, that's huge for us. Usually you get 10, 12 that, you know, we process, so. That's great. That's great. Thank you so much for that. Um, and also there are a few positions that we're still trying to fill in the district. So I think these combined outreaches really helps us um, recruit staff that could potentially fill other positions in the district um, as they get adjusted to the system. So thank you so much for putting all that together and working collabor collaboratively with neighboring school districts to, to make that happen for us. <clears throat> I was hoping Lizzie would be here to give us an update um, tonight, but I just wanted to highlight one thing that I'm really excited about. Last Friday was our homecoming um, game, and I know that uh, for the first time in a, a long time, or maybe, I don't know if it's ever, but our, um, some of our high school band students also came together to create a pep band. And so we're really looking at how do we create more opportunities across the arts um, for our students. And I was really excited for that to happen um, in support of our athletes and bringing uh, those groups of students together. So just wanted to, to make that point. And, you know, planning a homecoming event for, for the Scarborough Public Schools is like planning, I don't know, 50 weddings at once. <laughs> There's a lot of coordination. So I just wanted to also publicly thank Mike Legage and um, all the people who helped plan that and, and have such a successful, smooth event um, go off for our community because it really is a time to, to bring folks together from all aspects of the community. So thank you to Mike Legage and his his team for that work. And um, the last item I have on my superintendent's report is an, uh, just to share something that we're all really proud of and excited about. Last night, the town council meeting was held at the Wentworth School, and there were student-led tours starting at 6.15. I had the amazing opportunity to go on a tour with two of our Wentworth students, um, and there were small group tours that took kids all throughout the school and you could really see all of the features and then um, Kelly Crosby and I did a brief presentation to uh, the town council and the public who was there a and part of that presentation was a video that the students created with support from our, our new um, STEM teacher Brandon Johnston who also has a background in videography and production so we wanted to um, take this opportunity just to celebrate some more and also put a smile on your face because the students really did a fabulous job and it really gives the community a chance to take a sneak peek inside the school and see how are the students really maximizing that investment and um, giving you an idea of the return that you'll be getting on your investment as these students learn and grow in that facility. So um, at this time, Kelly Johnson is going to go ahead and play that for us. So sit back and enjoy. Hey, are you new here? Yeah. Wentworth is a great place. Here, I'll show you around. If you need to be dropped off before school starts, the floor care is right in the cafeteria. No buses needed and you can join the morning recess. Kids get dropped early. We open at 7 a.m. They come into the calf. They can finish up homework. They can get help from our counselors. And we have the gym. We have our classroom that we can use. We have the cafeteria. And we have the entire playground. Love to get them plenty of opportunities to, to get their energy out. There's always something every, going on. Every day is a new adventure. Every day is a new adventure. <laughs> this is your locker. Cool. It's purple because you're in a purple learning community. What is a learning community? A learning community is a group of classrooms that learn together as a community. Come on, I'll show you. This is your classroom. Every classroom has an Eno board, a projector, and every student has a laptop. We are so fortunate to have technology truly at the point of learning. Wentworth students are engaged learners that use technology to solve, create, and collaborate. The power of technology can be game changing, and we're definitely changing the game. We strive to integrate technology in a meaningful manner and facilitate a student-centered learning environment. Plus, every room has a temperature control so it doesn't get too hot or too cold. Come on, there's so much more to see. Thanks. You're welcome. This is the Learning Commons. It's a great place to check out a book, and it's a great place to get your work done because it's always so quiet. 
How do you check out books? Oh, we'll use those computers over there. Mickey just want to curl up and read a book. No, nope, he didn't. This is one of our music rooms. It's soundproof. And you learn a bunch of instruments and instruments families. Is there a school band? Yes, there's a school band in fifth grade. This is one of our art rooms. This is where your imagination can be wild. This is the gym. This is where you do physical education. It's also the best way to get exercise. Is gym the only thing you do in here? No, of course not. There's assemblies and also a stage, so you can do some plays. This wonderful space allows us to hold two gym classes at the same time. We also can accommodate the entire school for assemblies. And we have the middle school visiting us for their pep rallies and assemblies and speakers. The community uses this facility every single day. It's a wonderful part of our school and, of course, one of the most popular things for kids. This is our cafeteria. Wow, it's big. Uh-huh. Some of the food grows from our garden. The line looks huge. It must take forever to get your food. Actually, no. The lunch ladies are super nice, and the line moves quick. And some of the food goes back to our garden through our compost program. This is the playground. This is where you'll be doing aftercare, before care, and recess, of course. This is the green room. You can pretend to be wherever you want. It's really cool. See, I want to be at the beach. <laughs> like the North Pole. Like outer space. Whoa. This is one of our four STEM labs. Each one has 3D printers. What is STEM? STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. This beautiful facility that the Scarborough community has invested in has transformed from a state-of-the-art building into a thriving learning environment, not just for our students and for our staff, but also for the entire community. Everything from pickleball in the gym to mix and mingle square dance in the cafeteria. We have 55 plus programs, either just spend time together playing cards or have a guest speaker. So it's been really great. And the very best part is seeing when students and our seniors work together on a project. Whoa, look at the time. We should really get to class. Well, I hope you enjoy Wentworth. See you later. Bye. So just again, a special thank you to Liam and Talia for putting that video together and of course all the other staff that supported the work. Um, it really was a great opportunity to open the doors to our schools and um, let the community in. And we plan to do more things like that. We're brainstorming ideas about um, some other ways that we can really just, you know, either physically bring the community into the schools or um, create different videos that can be shared in multimedia ways. So thank you again to all the Wentworth staff. Okay. Um, chair's report. Donna is out of town, so I am the chair tonight. Um, just a couple things. I noticed that Mr. Creech snuck in. Coming right from, <laughs> coming right from uh, the conferences at the high school, which I just came from myself, and I was actually super impressed by the amount of parental participation. Because sometimes you think, you know, high school, They've been there, done that, but you know, we went, we had six. My husband and I had six conferences up there, and it was great, smooth, well-oiled machine, in and out. Do you know, get your your kids' information and move on. Um, it was very smooth. So thank you, Mr. Creech, and to the high school teachers. Um, also, we have a thank you note. Um, a couple meetings ago, we approved the facility use to waive the facility use for. Uh, nonprofit, and we got a thank you note. Um, thank you for your generous donation to the eighth annual Crop Out Childhood Cancer Fundraiser. This was another great year and could not have happened without your support. 
This year we raised just under $2,200, making our eight year total over $22,400. So it's nice that we were able to waive the facility fee for them as they are very appreciative every year. Um, so you covered homecoming. I'm trying to think of other stuff that Lizzie might have covered. Um, I think I think we're gonna have to go with that, what we've, what we've already got. So now on to 8.0 committee reports. Um, finance? I can go first, but I don't have a lot to say. We just met um, yeah. before this meeting for our year-end financials. So later on in the agenda, um, Kate Bolton, our business manager, will be going over that in detail. I don't want to spoil her fun. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as policy goes, we um, are continuing to winnow down our massive policy manual and we will have a whole bunch at our next meeting um, that we are recommending to be removed um, and as far as um, health safety and security task team we had our first meeting of the year and everyone kind of decided which subcommittee they're going to be a part of and that's um, the group that meets it's town-wide so there's public safety um, Nancy Kroll from the library administrators in the school department and really just trying to be proactive with any health safety or security issues that may arise and um, I think it's been a really good group it kind of flies under the radar but there have been a lot of um, emergency preparedness plans that have come out of it as well as um, well wellness the wellness policy um, revamp kind of came from that as well so we get a lot of work done it just like I said flies under the radar do you have any long-range planning do not. Okay. Um, Communication. Communications. We met on September 30th. Um, we discussed some general goals for the year, including the use of our Facebook page, continuing our newsletter, and also coordinating with Julie, um, with the new superintendent, seeing um, where we can come together, or how we can support new ways, um, and keep using our current methods of communication. We also discussed the use of comments on our Facebook page, as was brought up at our recent workshop with Drummond Woodsum. Um, we reviewed some other town pages, um, the Scarborough Town page, um, the Scarborough Police Department page, and we also looked through our past year or so of comments. We can't really find any egregious misuse of comments at this point. Um, and notice that commenting is open on several other pages that would be comparable to ours, and we've decided to keep comments open at this point. Um, but we have put a disclaimer at the top of the page explicitly stating uh, rude, inappropriate comments will be deleted um, and that those users may be subject to being banned from the page. Um, we've set a date to meet with Julie to discuss um, communications going forward uh, on October 17th, and our next committee meeting will be October 21st. Okay. The ne negotiations are calm at the moment. Uh, I'm hoping we will approve the contract with the teachers this evening. And once that is completed, uh, I'm sure the association is going to be in touch with us to start negotiations on the other two contracts due this year. Uh, Maine School Board's uh, next meeting will be Wednesday evening, the 26th, the eve of the Maine School Board Association uh, meeting in Augusta, state convention in Augusta. Now, I have written down here for tomorrow morning, 9 to 10.30 at the Public Safety Building. That is for Isn't Narcan that? training? Okay. We don't need that, correct? Well, we are invited to go. Well, all right, I have that down. And then, uh, would you like to report on the meeting that we had around uh, the feeding of the children? I think that's important for people to know about. Sure. Um, Jackie and I attended the townwide um, meeting. It was called Food for Thought in Action. And it was um, a bunch of community members who are all working toward um, eradicating hunger in Scarborough, you know, birth to senior citizens. And seeing what everybody does throughout the year and what their um, activities are and to see where we're crossing over or where there might be a gap. Um, there were about 25 people there. I was at the library and it was a great cross-section of people from Project Grace and from Kiwanis and from um, 
you know, just local gardeners who have been growing extra produce to bring to the food pantries, and the food pantries were represented. Um, so going forward, we're going to kind of collate what we discussed and make some action plans, and we talked about a harvest dinner next year or a fundraiser for the backpacks, and um, I think a lot of good is going to come from everyone working together. Everyone's been doing good in the community for a long time, but this way, um, working together, I think it could be more efficient and could help more people. So. The superintendent attended that That's meeting right. as well, yes, thank she did. goodness. And then Tuesday evening, it's been a busy week, mm -hmm. Tuesday evening, Jody and the superintendent and Mrs. Sizemore and I were at the, uh, the annual SEDCO dinner uh, representing the school department, and we had a very nice evening, and the guest speaker that evening was uh, the president of Hannaford and talked about the most important piece I took from it is that how important having local products in their stores has become a priority for Hannaford. And uh, there are a lot there. Thank you. Um, so we don't have any student representatives here, so moving on to recognition 10.0. All right, it's a big night. We have a couple of really uh, great recognitions to make. Um, first, I wanted to talk a little bit about our bus drivers. So in Scarborough, we currently have 21 very caring and dedicated bus drivers. Their experience ranges from two years in the district to 26 years in the district, with many of them serving right around you know, 10, 12 years. So um, to have that level of committed drivers is something that is really exciting and um, eases my mind in thinking about the safety of our children as that is um, our number one priority. But tonight we're noticing um, and recognizing one driver in particular. Uh, Carl Ivers is here with us tonight with some of his biggest little fans. Um, <laughs> on September 29th, you may have heard that one uh, that Carl, the bus that Carl drives was um, snagged by a wire that was caused from a fallen tree branch. And um, very quick on his feet, or quick in the seat, should I say, Carl immediately knew to call for support and um, response came quickly. All of the children that were on the bus, there were 12 students on the bus at the time remained on the bus as that was the safest um, place for them to be. But uh, Mr. Ivers kept them busy and distracted in a positive way by playing I Spy, I heard. <laughs> we got a little, <laughs> we got to play a little bit before the meeting started here as well. And then the children were able to arrive safely at school, smiling, happy, and relaxed. The principal, Mrs. Kelly Martin, met them at the school. Um, and then all of the parents were notified, but I think that there was a big uh, response both internally among the staff, but then also all of the parents in the community who are just so appreciative of you, um, Mr. Ivers, for being so thoughtful and caring and really making sure that all of our children were safe. So we wanted to take a few moments tonight just to recognize you. and. Um, I did not intentionally call while you were driving. <laughs> he accused me of intentionally calling his house when I knew he would be driving so that his wife would make sure he was here. <laughs> but I promise that was not my plan. It just happened to work out that way. But um, Carl, uh, did you want to say a few words or? The only thing I'd say is that any oh, other can you come over to the microphone, you please? Go over to the <laughs> Sorry. All of your fans I think he's starting to learn that we will not take no for an answer. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I wanted to say was any of the other bus drivers would have done the same thing. That's, you know, I mean, we're here, we work as a team. And, you know, we all, we, we like our job, we care for the kids, we try to watch out for them. So, I mean, any of them would have done the same. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Carl, if I'm correct, you've been driving our children safely to and from school for six years. Is that correct? Thanks. Were these children on the bus? We were on the bus at the time, but that's his. She used to have him. She's gone on to Wentworth, so she doesn't have him right now. And Lila was about to maybe be picked up if she felt like getting on the bus that morning. She was the next stop. Mm -hmm. and, uh, actually, she just, she, we thought we had already missed it anyway. Mm -hmm. 
That's awesome. Thank, thank you, you again, Carl. And thank you for coming in support. That really is special. Thanks. Uh, we have another very special uh, person to honor and recognize. Um, one of our teachers is here today. Jude Bayou uh, was recently recognized. And I believe we're going to share a video. But first, I just wanted to tell the community a little bit about Jude Bayou. She's currently a third grade teacher at Wentworth. Um, last night, if you were on the walking tours at Wentworth, you may have gone into her classroom. I know that I did. And immediately when I walked through the doors, I could tell how dedicated and inspiring and caring Jude is as a teacher. Um, and I felt like I could really spend a day in that classroom or 170 eight or two. Um, in the past, uh, my understanding is that Jude used to be a looping teacher, so some students had the opportunity of having you for two years, which is really awesome. But we, um, we do have a lot of dedicated teachers in the district, but it's really exciting when we can highlight uh, the kind of teaching and the kind of caring that we would hope to replicate in all of our classrooms. And so I hope that you enjoy this video, um, and you'll see some of that. But before we uh, press play, we also have two of the students who are featured in the video, I believe. You'll see them, um, and I'll introduce them afterwards. We are introducing you to another of Maine's inspiring educators. News Center's Jessica Gagne talked to a teacher in Scarborough who values volunteering just as much as academics. Yes, Jess? that is true. Jude Bayou teaches her third grade students subjects like math, reading, and all the other important academic subjects. But she also uses her class time to talk to kids about being good citizens. She believes that teaching kids about giving back to their communities helps them become more balanced adults. And some of her former students are proving just how powerful that that lesson is. We all need someone to look up to, and these kids have four examples right in their classroom. They make learning fun and easier. They aren't paid, they don't earn academic credits, but these teenage volunteers do get something from their third grade friends. Frozen. On you. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what to do. It's Try thinking. Here it goes. And start it again. Lasting memories. I'll always remember these times. Good times. <laughs> Mrs. Bay's class. Answering questions from the inquisitive kids, spelling big words, I don't know why. and working on community service projects together. It's all part of the fun, but also part of a more serious lesson Mrs. Bayou is trying to teach. The students need to be more well-rounded than just the basic strong academic student. Having these high school students come in and volunteer and show them what it means to give back to their community is pretty powerful. The proof is in the pudding. This glue wasn't really working out. A few of these teens had Mrs. Bayou as an elementary school teacher and remember what it felt like to have caring volunteers in the classroom. Now, a decade later, they are returning the favor. I'll grade their papers for them, or sometimes I just talk to them about their day at the end of the day, or play games with them. They're strong academic students, and they spend a lot of time with their family and friends, so for them to be able to give up over 800 hours to help us out. <laughs> Must be the hurricane. Yeah. <laughs> Hmm. Can you just rewind it a little, Cal? I can't even get, I don't even have the bar. Oh, okay. Well, okay. <laughs> Bummer. <laughs> 
Here's where those students are going to come in real handy right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we do have tonight. We do have uh, Natalie Russell here with Jude Bayou, oh. and also Cam. T- spelling big words. Oh. I don't know why. <laughs> and I'm on community <laughs> service projects together. It's all part, but also part of a more serious lesson Mrs. Bayou is trying to teach. The students need to be more well-rounded than just a basic strong academic student. Having these high school students come in and volunteer and show them what it means to give back to their community is pretty powerful. The proof is in the pudding. This glue wasn't really working out. A few of these teens had Mrs. Bayou as an elementary school teacher and remember what it felt like to have caring volunteers in the classroom. Now, a decade later, they are returning the favor. I'll grade their papers for them, or sometimes I just talk to them about their day at the end of the day, or play games with them. They're strong academic students, and they spend a lot of time with their family and friends, so for them to be able to give up over 800 hours to help us out, I think that, over any other project that we do, sends a bigger message. It's a message these eight-year-olds are receiving loud and clear. How can we be a contributing member of Wentworth? With help from... No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Almost done. <laughs> and the the, uh, the best the, the most challenging part of recognizing people is having to put them on the spot. But we are so proud of you, and we would like to ask Jude uh, to come up with the students who are here, Cam and Natalie, just to say a few words about your experience um, and. Remind us how you're helping all of our students grow to their full potential. Sure. So as I mentioned before, these two, along with Matt Blaisdell and Sebastian Osborne, have volunteered almost 900 hours now in my classroom in the past. Camp started in seventh grade, so about six years for him, four or three for the other kids. And it's during school time. When they get out of school, they come right over. During that time, they come after school for monthly after school activities. They do an end of the year field day during their finals time. They come into the classroom several days to do either field day or our class auction. So they'll work like five or six hours on a day that they could be out to the beach with their friends. During midterms, they come in and do a project with us during that time as well. They help me prep things all the time for the next day or for activities. They do some shopping for some of the stuff for the classroom with me. Um, it's, it's a huge help, huge help and the kids love it from year to year. <laughs> they look forward to it. My former students love seeing these guys in the hallway at the end of the day and waving to them. And actually just the other night we went to Cam and Matt and Sebastian's soccer game and Natalie sat with us the entire time cheering them on. So they're giving up a huge amount of their free time to give back to the community and show my students how truly important they are. So I'm super grateful for all four of these guys that are graduating this year. And <laughs> sad that they'll be leaving, but <laughs> they've made a big impact on maybe four or five classes of students now, so close to 100 kids. That's so great. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I had Mrs. Bayou as a third grade teacher, and I like adored her, and I, she's still my favorite teacher, and I was really lucky to like be able to come back and help these kids, and she helped me realize that I want to be a teacher when I grow up, so I'm like going to college now to be a teacher, and I'm like excited to do that, and like, I hope to be as good as her. And come back to Scarborough? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Right. Cam. Well, just to re- reiterate some of the things that they said, it's, it's an awesome experience to be able to, to volunteer in her class. Um, it's made me a better person. I really believe that. And hopefully I've helped some kids along the way be better themselves. Um, it's just being able to give back to your community. It's not always an easy thing to do, but Mrs. Veyu really does a good job at making it easy. And I thank her a lot for that. Awesome, thank you. I wanted to just thank Joanne and Principal Creech and Kelly and John because they're super supportive of letting these guys out of school for our two-hour interview piece. And Joanne always comes to our recognitions when we recognize these guys for hitting milestones. So I really appreciate the support that I've gotten from administration. So thank you. Jude is truly (laughs) deserving of inspiring educator, and that is proof just when someone says they want to be a teacher like Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. you. Good luck. Are you going to Bowdoin? Uh, No, maybe. Thanks for all your service hours. Thank you. Thank you for all the kids. Thank you for volunteering. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much for everything you do. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck. Um, just a, again for for the folks that are home listening and also the folks here in the audience the four students who have volunteered those almost 900 hours now are Natalie Russell who we met tonight Sebastian Osborne Matthew Blaisdell and Cam Tebow who is also here tonight <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to. Okay. So that was our last of the recognition, and so uh, we're going to take a short recess, like 35 seconds. So whoever is not quite as interested in the rest of the meeting is welcome to go. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to stay, of course. But <laughs> thank, thank you so much, you. Carl. Thank you, Jude. Have a great night. Thank you, thank you for coming. Great. So far, this is one of those meetings that we love. We're like, good things are happening and just feel good to be here. So moving on to new business, um, we have the meeting minutes of September 15th, 2016. Move approval is printed. Second. Any discussion, any changes? All in favor? That's six. Thank you. And then 11.2, um, the Maine School Board Association delegate. Every year we are invited to a two-day conference in Augusta, and most everyone tries to go for some portion of it. It's a full day and then another half day um, with obviously all the other school boards from the state, and it's a good chance to just connect and see what's happening in other corners. And Jackie's on the state board, and we have to every year elect a delegate besides Jackie to go um, and vote on measures that the main school board's uh, state board um, is is discussing and needs a vote on. So I know everyone is so dying to do it, but I heard maybe Jody <laughs> would love it again to do this year. Yes, I did it last year, and I'm happy to. I, I'm able to go, so I'm happy to okay. do it again this year. So I nominate Jody. Do we have a second? Second. Sure. Okay. Um, favor of Jody Shea being our delegate. Okay, six. Thank you. I think you do a del uh, alternate, an alternate as well. Okay. Nomination. <laughs> I don't mind no. being the I, alternate. Can you be? I can do that. Uh, you know, because I'm at the meeting anyway. I'd I'd rather not, but yeah. I can be. You, Carrie. Carrie. I'll do. Carrie wants to. Yeah. Good. Uh, if you guys would approve, I the nominate alternate. Carrie as the alternate. She hasn't had the chance with the fancy delegate ribbon, but maybe if something happens. She'll watch your back. Too. <laughs> I second that. Okay. <laughs> All in favor of Carrie as the alternate? Six. Good, you made it. Good. Okay, 11.3. 2018 June high school trip to Italy and France. We have Mr. Translito. Yeah, hi, good evening. Uh, I'm just coming to uh, discuss the um, plans for a 2018 and 2019 uh, trip to Europe with Scarborough students in June. I'm uh, just sitting here listening to um, the business of the meeting. I was thinking about going back to 2012. So we've had meetings in 2012, um, trips in 2012, 2014, 2015, 2016. Uh, we do have a trip in place to Portugal and Spain in 2017, which you are informed of from from last year. So tonight, just briefly, um, having talked with EF Tours, who is a really reputable company, the nation's largest tour company based here in Cambridge, Mass., um, the trend in a lot of schools is actually uh, planning trips out, believe it or not, even three years in advance. And one of the reasons for that is just making the cost of student travel more affordable. So for example, what I'm looking at doing is um, approaching students in 2018 and 2019. These would be current sophomores and juniors, um, a lot of the expectation is kids traveling at the end of their senior year or sometimes at the end of their junior year. But the advantage of planning a 2019 trip kind of in conjunction with 2018 is that the, it gives those kids um, two years basically to, to plan and often what most people do is uh, finance it by biweekly or monthly payments. So it makes the cost of student travel cheaper. It gives families and students more time to plan ahead. So that's why I'm 
coming tonight to talk about kind of two years as opposed to one year. Um, the proposed plan would be to travel to Italy and Southern Europe in June of 2018, and in June of 2019 would be to France and Northern Europe. The specific countries were, I'm still working with the tour company regarding the actual itinerary of the travel, but the plan would be Italy basically in 2018 and France in 2019. Um, one of the caveat I just wanted to bring up is um, looking at in light of what's happened this summer regarding travel in Europe. Um, I do believe, you know, I think everyone is somewhat on edge about international travel everywhere. Um, I do know we were fortunate we had a great experience going from Berlin, Germany, all the way to northern Italy without any incident. Uh, we took 29 students uh, from Scarborough. Uh, behavior was great. Kids have been always great. I've also been fortunate. I've been working with the same tour director for the last six years, which I think is unusual. Um, she and I have, have clicked so well that I've requested her every year. She's the only, I'm the only person I know of who's done student travel every year with the same person, um, with the same tour company. Um, so I'm looking to work with her in 2017, presumably in 2018 and 2019. So my last comment on just travel, we can't predict the international situation. Um, but I do know that uh, EF obviously travels with um, advisory from the State Department, and they take that very seriously. So I just wanted to put that out there that it is getting worrisome when you see what happened, for example, in July in, in um, Nice, France on Bastille Day, for example. Mm -hmm. So we were safely back. Um, students were great. But it does, it's a little bit sobering. So the, the travel business monitors that, and obviously um, uh, we'll keep that apprised as we go from year to year. So, so just wanted to inform you of that. Um, I have one other piece of business that I can bring up at this time. Um, just a shout out to the community. Uh, in October 29th, the Model United Nations Club, we're doing our second annual antique show fundraiser. And the purpose of it is to raise college scholarships. Uh, I was fortunate last year for the first time to give two very small scholarships, $500 each to two graduating seniors who are graduating from Scarborough High School. And I'm trying to keep that tradition going. We are now trying to do a biannual antique show. Um, we have one in place on October the 29th at the high school in the cafeteria with 60 plus antiques dealers from across New England. I'm working with Rachel Gurley, who is a Scarborough resident. Her uh, stepson, Connor, is a 10th grader at the high school. And her business is down at the Dunstan Corner School. So she's a local resident and uh, working with her. She's in the professional uh, antiques business. So hopefully the community will turn out. We had a great response in April, and we're looking forward to an e even bigger turnout uh, on October the 29th. Great. So. Thank you. I just Thank have you. one question. Um, working with EF, you may not yes. know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure actually you do probably know the answer to this. If a trip is planned two years out and kids have been saving and, you know, made all their payments, and then the political climate becomes one which you can't travel, I assume EF gives a refund or a credit for another trip at another time? They do, yeah. The, the um, initial deposit is $90, which basically locks in your um, travel time, and that price locks in at that point, and then any payment after that time is fully refundable within 30 days of um, travel. Okay. And if there should be an incident, hopefully we never experienced that, but if there should be some type of um, situation where travel would be suspended, a tour company, of course, would, would make good on that. Mm -hmm. um, EF has had tremendous success, I do think. I feel like I work for EF now, kind of. Yeah. Um, but they do have great success. They're the nation's oldest and really reputable travel company. Uh, I've had great success with them. Uh, students who've traveled with me probably would agree with me. And I've been really lucky just to have such a great connection with a tour director who I have great faith in. Uh, she has been outstanding. Um, I do know just that the Spanish program and the French program do student travel usually in April with the same tour company. So all of Scarborough, at least on the high school level, we are traveling with the same company and there's no competing business there. But I do know every year they've used different s travel leaders or tour directors and I know they've had varying satisfaction with that. So I kind of feel comfortable every year I know exactly what to expect with um, uh, my tour director uh, who's based in Rome and it's just been uh, awesome. So um, we're looking forward to more happy travel and I do think it has been enormously beneficial from, from kids who've graduated from the high school because I'm in touch with many of them who are now in college and some of them are now out of college and a lot of them have done uh, junior year abroad. Um, some of them have gone out to graduate school or looking at or studying uh, abroad internationally for graduate study. And uh, I do know for a lot of them they've 
they've said to me, this has really been kind of an entry way to the world and has kind of opened things up for me. So it's been a great experience for me. I just feel really lucky to have been a part of it this far. And as you know, for uh, several years, Lincoln McIsaac and I were doing tours together. I've done tours by myself. Um, next year, Lincoln is not. He is taking a break um, from doing student travel, so he is not going to be uh, on board with me in June. Um, but it's been a great opportunity, so I'm very grateful to the community and, and to the parents and the kids, and it's been positive for everyone. Right. So. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, go ahead. You mentioned Berlin and Italy, two great spots, and I yeah. totally applaud international travel. Can you talk a little bit about what sort of language preparation happens for the kids prior to their travel, and, and to what degree language acquisition is, is, a, is an outcome of this trip? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, a lot of the students do have some language. They've taken Spanish or um, uh, French uh, at the high school. Um, the tours we do are not particularly late language immersion, but they do, I know for the, um, uh, the Spanish kids, for example, we did Spain two years ago. We're going to go to Spain this June. Um, they, it's great opportunity. Our, my tour director is multilingual. She, sp she speaks Spanish, Italian, Mandarin. And so they do, they do get a chance to practice their language skills. Um, the other cool thing real quickly is that when we arrive in country, depending on where we are, uh, there are daily tour guides that we meet with who are experts in whatever we're looking at that's culturally important. So they're using their language and often they are, they do speak English, but a lot of times they'll use their native language. For example, when Spain, um, they were speaking Spanish with our students and they were getting a chance to practice their um, Spanish as well. And the focus really is education. Um, every step of the way when we go on our itinerary of the tour, every day it's, it's an educational focus where we're not just wandering around shopping. They're actually, we're visiting cultural sites and, get, and getting firsthand kind of um, information about um, where, what we're seeing in these countries. So um, I do know Helen Van Ness does the April trip to France. Her trip is for AP French students and for uh, honors French students. And that trip, I believe, is in the French language. Um, so they, EF does offer that type of travel. And um, I do think they do speak some English, but the tour director speaks in the language of, of France. So those kids are getting a real immersion. Um, student travel I've been doing, they informally get to practice the language. Um, and the tour guides will use language um, if students are studying that, like in Spain. Um, and they will be able to practice it. One of the reasons we're going to Spain this year, just real quickly, is um, we were originally going to go to Australia and New Zealand, which I originally had gotten permission from you to do that. And um, for a couple of reasons, it did not. We had about 10 students sign up. Um, I think two reasons we had fewer kids signing up, the distance of travel. I think some kids were a little bit, just the, it was basically a day of travel each way. Um, and the cost, it was about $1,500 more expensive. Um, this year there is not a Spanish trip uh, being offered, so I thought that would be a perfect opportunity to bring those Spanish kids who might normally be traveling with the Spanish program to go to Spain and Portugal and, and hopefully have that opportunity to use their language skills and see a little bit of the world that they've been learning about um, in the high school. So that's why we're going to Spain this year. So if you're wondering, what happened to Australia? Um, which all worked out fine. Um, next year, uh, in 20, uh, 2018, I mentioned Italy and Southern Europe, uh, France, France and Italy, and then 2019 would be France and Northern Europe, not exactly where yet. But again, those French kids and those Spanish kids would, um, would have that opportunity too, so. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so 11.4 appointments. The first appointment we have is a, a Pleasant Hill special education teacher. Darlene Boisenhalt has been nominated to fill this position created by a resignation. Mrs. Boisenhalt received her Bachelor of Science degree in special education from the University of Maine in Farmington. She has been a special education teacher for over 20 years in elementary schools in both Old, Old Orchard Beach and Dayton. Mrs. Boisenhalt will be placed on step 23 of the Bachelor's Plus 15 scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Darlene Boisenhalt as a Pleasant, Hill, uh, a Pleasant Hill School Special Education teacher. Move approval. Second. Second. Any discussion or all in favor? Six, thank you. 
11.4.2 is the are the Wentworth co-curricular positions so various staff have been nominated to fill these positions that will be funded from the general fund I'm happy to read each name um, but I think the the most important piece to see is that on the list you have there there are still a few clubs that have not been filled but the majority have been and again this is all um, from the general fund so the recommendation is to appoint the Wentworth co-curricular positions as presented in the agenda item 11.4.2 and do you just want to read those names sure um, so for the computer technology club it's Barbara Merritt for the literature club Patrick Reagan foreign language club Nikki Vafiatis. <laughs> Vafiatis, thank you. Foreign Language Club, Robin Viola. Theater Arts Club, Anne. Um, La Liberty. La Liberty and Patrick Regan. Um, for the Homework Club, Kate Shire Webster, Carla Griffin, and Kimberly Pecoraro. Okay. Again, the recommendation is to appoint those folks to the Wentworth co curricular positions as presented. So, approval. Second. All in favor? Six. Various staff have been nominated to, um, or actually, I'm sorry, a combination of school staff and community members have been nominated to fill the Jim Dandies positions that will be funded by the Jim Dandies Booster Club Fund. Um, happy to read those names with some help also. So sure. <laughs> the director, again, will be David Slopeman. He's also one of our teachers. The coordinator will be um, Ellen Parento. And then we have several instructors, instructors, Dina Bennett, Barbara Merritt, Marie Trombley, Michael DeRosa, Valerie Raza, Amy Colton, Michelle McPherson, Aaron Huth, Anne Orenstein, and Elizabeth Chalmers. The recommendation is to appoint the Jim Dandies positions as presented in the agenda item 11.4.3. Move approval. Second. All in favor? I just wanted to comment yeah. on those just to make sure we noted that they were booster funded. Right. Yes. yes. Was that a, did I see all the hands? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Six. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the next item, 11.4.4, middle school winter coaches. A combination of school staff and community members have been nominated to fill these positions that will be funded from the general fund. Um, the seventh grade boys basketball coach, Scott Weymouth. Eighth grade boys basketball coach, Ryan Colpitz. Seventh grade girls basketball coach, Mike Bogarts. And eighth grade girls basketball coach, Brian Rice. The recommendation is to appoint the middle school winter coaching positions as presented in the agenda 11.4.4. Move approval. Second. All in favor? Six. Thank you. I just have a quick question. If those um, clubs, the video club, civil rights club, homework club, yearbook club, aren't filled, does that mean that we won't have those clubs for the Wentworth students, or are we confident no. that they will be filled? They just haven't been filled yet. We just got the names. Oh, okay. Perfect. Okay, great. And there will also be um, additional appointments to the middle school sports. These are just the basketball coaches that are presented tonight. And I apologize to anyone whose name I mispronounced. <laughs> Thank you. 11.5, year-end financial report, the Kate Bolton Show. <laughs> Five viewers. Actually, I've got quite a crowd tonight, right? Will you find me? I'll find you. All right. Good morning. I print them off? You probably did. The only thing that you wouldn't have printed would have been the PowerPoint slides, which some of which you can read, I have some of which you, didn't you give don't have to. Yeah. Um, I do. Actually, you know what? Oh, I, I need the PowerPoint slide. Because the, right. uh, the slides. There was a little edit on 
the notes and comments of the financial report after Kelly emailed them out. I'll make sure everybody has the latest and greatest version. Okay. Very soothing. Hi, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to come and talk to you about money. <laughs> Cal, I know you gave me the clicker thing. Do, if I just hit the down arrow, will that work too? Okay. I'm, I'm not really all that, that tech savvy. So we're here tonight to talk about the end of fiscal 2016, which is the school year 2015-2016. Um, we're well immersed in the first quarter finishing up of 2017, but now we're taking a look backwards because now we're closing things out and this is the <coughs> time of year when I come and report to you about year end. So typically when I'm doing these reports, I start thinking about things besides money and I like to start out talking about the, some of the things that we were working on and thinking about in 2015-16 just to set things in context for us for a minute. So uh, the first thing I've noted is that we, we spent a lot of time in 2015-16 as school leaders articulating our commitment to student-centered learning. And really that's led to some changes across the district intended to support student voice and choice and goal setting and clear and individualized pathways to proficiency. So that's kind of a huge model shift that we're working on across the district. Um, perhaps our biggest impact investment in FY16 was to provide one-to-one -one computer access for students at Scarborough High School. Scarborough High School students and staff were provided a Lenovo laptop computer with programs and software aligned to academic course images on each device. And a tech integration coach assisted the staff with developing the best classroom practices available for each content area. This initiative has allowed great advances in learning opportunities and methods, and with the resources available at the new Wentworth School that we just saw earlier this evening, this allows critical access to instructional technology now from grade three through graduation, which is a pretty big stride for our district. The 2015-16 year also saw a major commitment to increasing the quality of our communication and outreach to the community. This is something we were talking about earlier as well. The school board and the town council finance committees adopted a collaborative budget development process, including a shared web portal, and school leaders developed a new budget format to more clearly communicate the work of the schools and the allocation of town resources to the schools. Targeted communications for parents, students, and the community were created and the new district website and social media platforms were leveraged to allow easy access to information about our schools and our work. Next bullet is the, long, the school board's long range planning facilities committee. They spent the year reviewing some options for responsible school facilities management and investment based on a comprehensive report that we received from Harriman Associates in 2014-15. This should all sound kind of familiar to you guys, right? This is, this is a recap of everything you've been doing. In January 2016, we received an updated school enrollment projections report. And because of the unique nature of the town of Scarborough, the specialists at planning decisions actually developed a new projection model for us to more accurately incorporate housing starts into their usual calculations. The new housing impact model, which they named it, suggests that current enrollment numbers will hold and continue to increase as we approach 2025. Um, we had already surpassed their enrollment projection for 2016-17 with the numbers that Julie was reading to you this <laughs> evening. This, we hope, will allow the school board to plan for sustainable delivery of student services over the next few years. And finally, in 2015-16, the school board introduced a five-year capital improvement budget model for facilities, transportation, and technology. Having this capital budget allows the school board and the town council to work collaboratively to manage debt 
and prioritize, prioritize investments over the long term. So that little trip down memory lane, we now turn to the money, jumping right into the financials. You have a report with you that starts with two pages labeled notes and comments. And as I was saying earlier to the Finance Committee, the notes and comments are designed so that I can post this on the website and not be there to hold everyone's hand through the process of reading our financial report. As much as I wish that everyone in the community were watching this tonight, I have a feeling some of them are watching baseball, and so we have notes and comments. Uh, what we're going to do tonight, though, is skip right to page three. Uh, I'm sorry, you'll, you'll see it on page four in the printed financial reports. No, hang on. Page three. My notes are wrong. Page, page three in the financial report. Page three is the notes and comments. Sorry. On page four, <laughs> under <laughs> notes and comments, at the top of the page, You'll see a little section that talks about the transition from the beginning to the end of the fiscal year 20, 2016. And it, it looks a little different on the slide, but what you're looking at is um, the summary on page four says you've got the available fund balance at the start of the fiscal year, the budget to actual status as we move through the fiscal year, and the ending fund balance as of June 30, 2016. So this is a place where a lot of folks turn to, to find out how did we finish out the year. And typically when we turn to this page, we'll see an undesignated fund balance at the end of the year of somewhere between 300,000, 500,000. Um, this year, as you can see, there's a $1.96 million available undesignated fund balance. So let's talk about what that means. If you were with us during the budget development process for FY17, you'll remember a number of finance committee conversations about the appropriate level of fund balance to carry from one year to the next. As I said, you know, typically we carry um, 300 dollars to $500,000 at the end of the year. <coughs> at the end of fiscal 15, you can see at the top of the chart, we ended up with $965,000, and we decided to use $425,000 of that to support the fiscal 16 budget. So what we had left, undesignated, meaning unclaimed, unused, and available for, uh, for uses in future years, we had the $540,000 to carry forward. That represents about 1.3% of the fiscal 15 budget. In the next section of the chart, you see at the end of fiscal 16, now we're going down through that middle section, we had a savings or surplus of $2.2 million in expenditures, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, a shortfall of $131,000 in revenues, and a need for $237,000 in year-end fund transfers. So within the fiscal 16 year, we've generated an additional fund balance of $1.8 million. Add that amount to the 540,000 we started with, take out $425,000, which is being used right now in the fiscal 17 budget, and it leaves about $1.96 million in the bank for us as undesignated fund balance moving forward. So how did we end the year with a $2.2 million expenditure surplus? That's exciting. Again, if you were with us during the fiscal 17 budget development conversations, you'll recall that in March of 2016, the town council and school board finance committees were advised that there were about $2.6 million in unspent Wentworth building project funds once the project was closed and audited. At that time, we developed a plan to use the available funding to pay debt costs for the Wentworth project in both fiscal 16 and fiscal 17. And as we talked about in the finance committee, that was in fact the only use to which we could put those funds. They were bonded for Wentworth and they needed to be spent on Wentworth. So they were, uh, the decision was to spend them on Wentworth debt service. 
Since the money had already been budgeted and appropriated for fiscal 16, we were able to replace that money with the project funds. This freed up the budgeted funds to be carried over as surplus. So as you look on the slide, you can see 1.37 million in Wentworth project funds replaced the budgeted amount that we had already set aside for fiscal 16. The town council and the school board finance committees have agreed that this fiscal 16 budget surplus will put the town in a great position to weather the expected continued reductions in state aid to education. As Scarborough continues to thrive economically in comparison with other towns in the state, we anticipate that less state funding will come our way and we'll need to adjust to funding a higher percentage of our school costs locally. The surplus generated in FY16 can be carried forward into FY18 and even 19 to help mitigate the impact of that loss of outside revenues for the schools to Scarborough's taxpayers. I also have a bullet on here that explains that the two-year plan is to use the remainder of those project funds and that's already budgeted in fiscal 2017 as part of the process when we discussed this last spring. So clearly the use of the Wentworth project funds was the primary factor in generating a budget to actual expenditure surplus of $2.2 million. But there were a few other areas of savings that we should note tonight. Um, the bullet there repeats the information in the number on Wentworth and then the second bullet says <coughs> something that's particularly noteworthy I think we heard some of this at, a, at our workshop meeting recently from special services we came in under budget on special services tuition costs by over two hundred and forty thousand dollars and this is a, a positive trend in special services where we've been able to bring back and reintegrate into our school community a number of students with significant special needs. Students who were in private schools receiving services have now been able to come back into our community. And as I was saying in finance, this is the flip side of where we were last year when we had an excess of costs in that same tuition line because we had a number of kids in expensive placements and also at the same time the state had allowed those schools to raise their rates in fiscal 15. So we're excited about having these kids be able to come back into a less restrictive setting. You know, kudos to special services staff to be able to give amazing learning opportunities to these kids right here in our own schools. And we get to save some money. Um, and then as I'm sure everybody noticed, we did have some energy and fuel savings. Um, we talked about this during budget development as well. Not a million bucks, but a hundred thousand bucks. Um, overall, district wide, we're saved in energy and fuel accounts. Um, our budget for bus driver wages and benefits was also underspent by over a hundred thousand dollars. This is not by choice. Unfortunately, it reflects the difficulty that we've been experiencing in finding qualified drivers, especially subs and we've been running short staffed. So we've saved some money, which is lovely, but we'd rather have some good bus drivers if you know any out there. The rest of the savings is made up of incremental savings throughout the operating budget, amounts to about 390,000 or 0.9% of the total budget. And those are achieved through regular turnover of staff and careful spending so that we can continue to come in under budget as we're required to by law. So, as you know, I'll be requesting an action item from you tonight to authorize budget transfers to in balance individual expense accounts that have been overspent by $10,000 or more. This is required by policy DBJ. These year-end budget transfers ensure that we take note of these accounts and we can perhaps use that information to refine future budget development. As usual, wherever we have a deficit in one account, we have a surplus in another area to use to offset it. This year's budget transfer request, which is the fancy colored paper that has pink and yellow and green, just to make you excited and wide awake at this late hour. Uh, this request has nine overspent expense accounts. Uh, that's out of 624 budgeted accounts, so it's a pretty good ratio. 
The value of the transfers that we're asking for tonight represents 0.44% of the fiscal 16 budget. And that indicates to me that we're fairly accurate in our budget estimates when we went into the first of the year. So if you want to take a look at that budget transfer document now, the one with the pink on it, we'll just talk about what's on there and what we're asking you for. Um, you'll see that is in, as in prior years, there's a number of account overruns in individual salary, wage, and benefit accounts, and those are typically due to personnel changes during the course of the year. Um, and again, in most cases, the accounts that have run over budget can be offset by surplus in other wage and benefit accounts where for the same kinds of reasons we have excess budgeted funds. In the middle of the document this year, there's two benefit lines in the school administration category. And remember, these are laid out by the voter categories that folks use when they go to the polls for referendum. Um, we're offsetting those by savings in other lines from system administration rather than school administration. Um, and those two, I, I point to you, a very clear example of the turnover effect. We figure out the appropriate budgeted amount for an employee in December. By the time we roll around to the start of the new school year, that employee may have left us and been replaced by someone else with different needs. So these two accounts uh, were actually specific employees where we had budgeted for one employee without <coughs> benefits. That employee retired or resigned and a new employee came on board and required uh, health benefits and insurance costs were higher. So it looks like a drastic change, but it's really just the effect of one person in a very small account um, having a, a different person come into that space. So it's kind of dramatic looking, but if you had an account that had more people in it, you probably wouldn't even see it because one person would come and another person would go. So these are the only two lines that are offset by surplus in a different voter budget category, and they're using savings in two of the central office contracted services lines. Apart from salaries and benefits, there's only a couple of other cost overruns on that chart you're looking at. Bus maintenance and repairs ran a bit over budget due to necessary vehicle repairs, and we're able to offset that cost overrun with savings in the bus fuel line due to lower gas prices, as we discussed earlier. Um, the next one, I think, is, is the next two are, are of most interest to me in terms of you know, figuring out things going forward. In facilities and maintenance, we've got a couple of overruns that are related to the new Wentworth building. And when we were developing the budget for fiscal 16, we had just opened the new building and there were a lot of unknowns for us, a lot of guesses. We made our best estimates as the year went on. We recognized we needed to, uh, first of all, deploy additional custodial staff. Um, and in part, that was to accommodate all of the community events being held in this wonderful new facility, which we've been hearing about a lot tonight. Uh, as you'll see, we're planning to offset that additional cost with savings in custodial wages at the middle school, so we'll be able to redeploy some existing staff. Likewise, at Wentworth, the cost of contracted repairs and maintenance exceeded our estimates. Uh, we're able to offset that additional cost with savings due to the mild winter and avoiding spending on extra snow removal that's typical in a heavy snow season. So we're still learning about the needs of the Wentworth building, but we've adjusted our estimates in the FY17 budget that we're currently operating under so that we could take this information into account. So this slide, if anyone can actually read it, is, is a um, reproduction of the top of page three in the year-end financials report, the one that starts with notes and comments. And really what you're looking at here is just a more detailed version of the expenditures, the budget, and the savings at the year end. And so the, the pieces that you can, you can grab onto here will be that column that says year end balance. And you can note that some of the things I've just been talking about are clearly represented there. For example, at the bottom of the page, you've got the debt service savings of 1.37 million. Uh, but you can also see that there's a savings of $300,000 in special services, which directly relates to that tuition uh, account that we were talking about, and some of the other areas where there's been spending, um, spending savings and spending overruns. So this is a summary. 
and again it's laid out in the voter category so that you can see um, how the budget was originally built and where we landed this is another view of the year-end totals by category and this time it shows tonight's requested budget transfers between categories um, this page is slightly less illegible, uh, but this is a simplified version of page two of the budget transfer handout. So I'm sending you back to the pretty colored one. Um, and what we're doing there is we have to reflect those spending categories that are posted at the polls for the referendum voters to review. And according to state statute, and that's this little blurb at the bottom of the page there, um, the school board during the year for which the budget is approved may transfer an amount not exceeding five percent of the total appropriation for any cost center to another cost center or among other cost centers without voter approval that's the statute and it's something that both the department of education looks at and the auditors look at each year when they review our books they want to make sure that um, even though this is a little bit of an arbitrary distinction they want to make sure that when the public voted to say we're going to spend the money in these categories in our schools that we're not sort of randomly throwing money into other categories without their approval so as you can see from the chart if you can read it or the one that's on your financials we've got one intercategory transfer that we're looking for and that's what i was referring to earlier between school administration and system administration um, the value of that change is $33,408 and it, it's removing 3.35% uh, from system administration, which is less than the 5% threshold, which keeps us within the meaning and the, the language of the statute. So essentially what we're saying is we're asking you to do this under our policy, but we're also honoring the wishes of the voters in the way that we're doing it. So let's see, I keep taking you back and forth, but now if you look at the revenue page on your financial report, that's page three of the one that starts with notes and comments. It's underneath the expenditure piece, the bottom of the page. You can see that we have an overall shortfall of $131,851 against our budget projections. GPA or general purpose aid that state subsidy shows a shortfall of $43,000 and uh, I was sort of tripping over myself in finance trying to explain this but essentially what it is is that the state rather than giving us all of our GPA that they promised to us withhold some of it to spend on uh, payments to special purpose private schools and it's a very long story but essentially the the thought is that the state didn't believe that the school districts were doing it properly in order to correctly leverage federal funds in support of medicaid and so they decided they would make those payments on our behalf and take it out of our subsidy for us but what it means is that when we receive a tuition bill from a special purpose private school we don't owe them that money on the expenditure side now so there's an offsetting savings in tuition and again that's reflected in the um, in the tuition savings that we talked about earlier state agency client reimbursements and Medicaid reimbursements come from the state and they're based on the eligible enrollment of specific students and the services that they're receiving so they're notoriously difficult to budget the population of students is very mobile um, the ability to qualify and be eligible uh, changes from year to year and so we do have a little shortfall on both of those and the three of those items together leads to about the hundred and thirty one thousand dollars so our main focus is on the general fund but we also include figures on education adult education school nutrition grants and trusts which includes the Feinberg Trust and the Scarborough Education Foundation federal restricted funds which include the federal title grants and local entitlement or IDEA aid to special education and a separate year-end status report on CIP projects and these are in your financial report on pages four through six uh, just a couple of quick points of interest in this area we've got um, in the local grants grants and trusts we've got proficiency based graduation grant funds from the state 
And those have been available uh, in fiscal 15. We received our first payment. We've also had allocations in fiscal 16 and 17. Um, and in fiscal 16, we focused on using some of those funds for curriculum work and professional development. Um, but we've built up a pretty good sized fund balance. And in fiscal 17, we're using those for a, a, a consultant to join us at the high school. And um, I know that David and Catherine have both spoken to this group about some of the things that they're doing with NEASC and proficiency based graduation. This year, there's also a new entry called PEPG state grant. And I really had a hard time figuring out what all the P's were uh, when we were talking about in finance, but it's Performance evaluation. performance evaluation and professional growth. It's basically the teacher evaluation system that was mandated by the state of Maine, and they've sent us um, a lovely $4,600 check to take care of all the work that we're doing <laughs> to build that system. <laughs> Uh, but we didn't send it back. We used it for some of the professional development that we've been um, doing with the Marzano system and with eye observation. So adult education has its own fund. You'll see that uh, in the financial statement as a separate under other funds. Adult education spending stabilized after a period of investment in fiscal 14 uh, when we were creating some, some uh, infrastructure for some of the new workforce programs. Uh, we had some laptops and some technical equipment that we needed to purchase. Uh, so we've got that in place. Uh, tuition revenues fell a bit short of projections. And when uh, we were talking in finance, Joanne was saying that really the, the it, issue is mostly the um, enrichment programs, that the workforce programs are still going great guns. We've got a great CNA class um, that's enrolled right now, and those continue to be extremely popular. And um, I've noticed also that there's a, a, a big growth in the English language learners group. And um, what Joanne was saying was that we've been partnering with Portland, who has an overflow of folks trying to learn the English language as a second language, or in some cases, a third or fourth language. And uh, so those folks have been invited to come over to Scarborough, and we've added some classes there. And uh, I think that's a really nice um, introduction into our community for those folks. Um, the fund balance for adult education ends at $10,000 plus. Um, it is its own separate fund so that we had some money that we had generated in fiscal 15, which we were able to carry over into the new year, and we still have a healthy fund balance there at the end of fiscal 16. In school nutrition, we ended the year with a $55,000 budget to actual surplus on the expenditure side. Um, and just to take a step back and talk about school nutrition in general, we had the arrival of our new school nutrition director, Peter Esposito. He came in July of 2015. And we've all heard some reports about that, and we were just talking about getting some more reports about that and, and how interesting that program's become and uh, how forward thinking. We've had a number of changes an emphasis on healthy local ingredients, on scratch cooking. Um, they've done some improved inventory management. They've created some savings in, in food costs that are pretty substantial. Um, that has been offset in some places by some higher spending on staff wages uh, because you need more staff to cook the food yourself than you do to open a box. Uh, we've also done some replacement and repair of kitchen equipment, which was sorely needed, and we've got a plan and some investments for that in the, in, in the ensuing years, in both in CIP and in operating. We've heard lots of reports of the improved quality of our school lunch menus, and the program is definitely building as a resource for catering meetings and events district-wide. Uh, while our meal counts are going up and sales are improving, fiscal 16 year-end revenues still show a deficit as we expected. And we also have to contend with a reduction in budgeted support from the general fund where we contributed 75,000 in fiscal 15 and in 16 we only budgeted 25,000. So your second action item for tonight will be to approve a year-end balancing fund transfer for school nutrition of $237. $65. In capital projects, you've got a year-end summary. Most of our projects are either a multi-year sort of 
almost you could call them generic projects such as roofing replacement, flooring replacement, um, and some of them are individual projects. And it's pretty clear to see what, what those are. There, there is one item on page six, this is a, on, on the financial report, that is noteworthy, I think, because we do have a large carryover balance of over $500,000 in the district-wide security and access management account. If you look to the far right of that sheet, you'll see the remaining balance at year end. So in that account, uh, we had originally approved funding. We made a big facilities investment in fiscal 14 and 15 um, with the idea that we needed to do some serious access management in the wake of the Newtown disaster, I guess we call it, um, and to beef up security and entrance management at our K-2 schools and also at the middle school. So you'll remember that those projects did happen um, and that they've been very successful, but there was a portion of that same project that involved putting generators in at the K-2 schools and that would be you know, a, a safety and security issue if we had power failure uh, or a natural disaster near the K-2s. We held off on spending that $500,000 for two reasons. One, because we were going through the long-range planning process and talking about the fate of our K-2 schools in general and what was the long-term goal for those primary schools. And then secondly, once we got through that process, um, we learned that the town IT department was working on their own disaster recovery plan and that a, certainly a large portion of that would involve how we would have backup systems at the K-2 schools. So the money is still there, it's still budgeted, it's still intended for the same purposes, it's just that we didn't wanna go and spend it without having a clear plan and a clear result uh, for that spending. So now I'm gonna look forward for just a second and talk about fiscal 17 and we actually closed the first quarter of fiscal 17 last week when we weren't looking because we were busy looking back at 16. Um, the next finance committee meeting is on November 3rd, is that right? Um, the first Thursday in November. And uh, so we'll be doing the first quarter financials, which is typically when, when we get around to taking a look at those. And we'll also get those out to the full board. I won't come and talk to you for 20 minutes about it because this is this is plenty. Um, and first quarter is not nearly as exciting. Um, but we will be uploading the financial data to the Department of Education. We do that every quarter. I just need to whine a little bit that they've put in a new software system, which doesn't work, and they're working it out, and we'll we'll get there. But just just another joy of of working with the Department of Education. We're also right now gathering materials for the auditors. They plan to join us the week of November 7th and do their field work uh, here in this building. Um, and typically that involves you know, pulling invoices and going down through financial reports and, and reviewing all of our policies and procedures right here in house with us so they can ask us questions. Um, Obviously, that's a piece of a bigger project that goes on with the town, and I think, as you will recall, that happens all the way through November into December, and typically we get a report from the auditors at the end of December and um, a meeting with them so that they can do a presentation for us sometime in January. And the last slide I have is the action items that we're requesting tonight. I think Jody's probably going to introduce those for you so that you have motions under agenda item 11.5. Um, if there are questions right now that would help clarify things for anyone, I am ready. I just have one quick question. I noticed on the um, school activities fees, that's in the black. Is that the first time that one's been in the black? Yes. And you know what? I should have added that in because we, we talked about that in finance and I didn't have it in my notes. But yes, this is the first time it's been in the black. And um, of course, that's tremendously exciting. I think that we can attribute it pretty much, I think, to, well, I, there are a number of factors. One, one factor that I think is important is that people have learned that we have fees and that we have gone through a generation of students and parents who weren't used to doing that, and we've gotten a whole new generation of students for whom that's 
the normal way to do things and they're ready and they're, they've got their checkbooks and their credit cards out and they're good to go. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is some, some of the systems that we've put in place. Um, I shout out to Mike and his crew, uh, Jake at the middle school, the athletic liaison, Jordan in the high school office. They've put in this family ID system where they're doing all the enrollments online. Um, they're gathering all the data together. They've got some really good solid systems for tracking and also for communicating with parents. So they know exactly who's doing what when um, and they know whether they've paid or they haven't and they can reach people easily to find out if there needs to be waivers or, um, I mean, it's, it's really cool. And also the third thing we talked about was the access to the online payment system through RevTrack. And again, more and more people are getting used to that. It's very easy, it's very quick. It's just, you know, boom, we're done. And so I think the combination of all of those things has gotten us to the point where we can say this is our budget and hey, guess what? We actually got it. Yeah, yeah. that's great. I know it's not a ton of money. No, but it's a- Overall, it, but yeah. that, I looked at that, I was like, that is a milestone. It is a right. milestone, absolutely. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about the food services budget for this fiscal year and maybe projecting forward to another year or two? Is there um, a plan to try to recoup the money or to minimize? Is this going to be sort of a repeated thing? Was this a one-time thing? Can you like characterize it within sort of a multi-year context? Well, it has been a problem for years. Um, I'd say at least six years we've run it in a deficit. And um, one of the concerns that we've had over all that period of time has been that we're only permitted to charge a certain amount under state statute for school lunches. And so you've got this uh, pressure coming from the USDA saying you must serve these foods, healthy foods to students. We're only going to reimburse you this much and you can't raise your prices. So we've been in a little bit of a pinch for that for years and years. Um, what we've seen with Peter coming on board is that he truly believes that if he creates good food that he can increase his meals and that he can actually get the program back into the black. Um, I'm a little more conservative in terms of how quickly that can happen. I notice that we're in under budget and that he's operating the program very efficiently and doing a great job with that. I think that the meal sales um, this is something we just talked about in finance as well. The meal sales will come as people begin to understand that, that it's not mystery meat with weird gravy. It's real good, locally sourced, amazing food. Um, we've seen some really, I think, um, positive jumps in things like adult meals and in the catering program where we're doing you know, events or, or meetings. Though the catering jumped like 46% from fiscal 15 to 16, which is not a big a lot amount of money. It's not their main job. Obviously, they're feeding students. But I thought it was an interesting uh, phenomenon. And uh, what I believe it was Carrie said was it's, it's not so much the, the kids who care whether their food comes from a local farm. They would like it to taste good. Um, but the parents will care, and uh, what we were saying in the finance committee was it, it was a great opportunity for um, some of the communication outreach to feature school lunch, to talk about the changes, to say, hey, you know what, your, your kid is not going to eat some weird lunchroom food like you had when you were in the sixth grade. This is quality stuff. It's actually restaurant quality, um, and we're not sure how many people really know that. Um, so I'm not really answering your question. I'm kind of, kind of dancing around it because I really can't get my crystal ball out. I know that in recent years we'd sort of gotten used to saying, oh, we're just not funding it enough. Um, well, and I guess the, the question I ultimately have is if, is if this, if we know this is an issue, right, and it happens from year to year, can we put more money in it next year? So it's not, a, I mean, I guess I just wonder, and I'm not an accountant, but is there an advisability to stick to running a deficit no, there's not. That is such a great idea. Um, if you had been here for the last five years, you would have heard me making that argument. And that we need more money. In that the we need to fund it through the general fund. Most school districts put money in their general fund. 
program to some extent. It's not expected to be a money maker. I'd say maybe half the districts break even and the other half are contributing from their general fund. So yeah, it's been a topic of conversation every budget season. We know we're gonna have a deficit, why don't we budget for it? It's irresponsible not to budget for it. Well, you know, maybe we'll do better, maybe we won't. Um, I would love to see a $200,000 allocation in the general fund budget every year and if we don't need it okay that's great and truthfully to me if we could say we had a program that touched every kid in scarborough every day probably two meals and made it possible for them to be successful in school because we're feeding them and nourishing them and it costs the district two hundred thousand dollars i'd buy that program Though we haven't really gotten there yet. It's just, it's another pressure point in limited resources in the funding. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else? Jody, do you have some motions for us? I do. Uh, move approval to authorize budget transfers for accounts overspent by more than $10,000 per details provided to the school board by the business office. Second. Any further discussion? Anyone? Okay, all in favor? Six. Thank you. Uh, I have a second one. Move approval to transfer $237,065 from general fund year end ba fund balance to cover school nutrition fund deficit. <coughs> second. Do we have any discussion about that one? We, we talked in, just briefly to follow up on your question, we talked in the finance committee um, of sort of putting a little bit of pressure on the communications committee um, to find ways to help publicize what we have going on. I think a lot of times we're all living and breathing all of these things that are happening and great things that are happening in our school, but the community doesn't know. So I'm willing to bet a large majority of our community doesn't know that we even have a new nutrition director, mm -hmm. let alone what he's providing for food. Um, because you're still just hearing what your kid says was for food and you know, that's where you go with it. So I think for us to sort of take that on a little bit more and, and communicate the great things that are coming out of there, um, that might help boost sales even more. Well, and I just want to say, you know, as a state, and it's no less true for Scarborough than it is for any other part in the state, frankly, is that we have these two, you know, related but separate issues of food scarcity and also obesity, you know, and it's a statewide program problem, and it's a problem in Scarborough. And so we have some kids who are hungry, you know, we heard about this earlier tonight, um, and we have kids who, um, you know, for a variety of reasons, their nutrition is such that, you know, they already are encountering, you know, issues of obesity. And I think that, you know, one of the, the greatest educational moments we have, and frankly, some of the greatest sort of ethical responsibilities we have to these kids is to feed them, right? They cannot be educated if they are not fed, right? And if they're not fed the right stuff. You know, and so for me, it's just a complete no brainer because investing in the wellness of our children is investing in the whole person and in the education. All the educational initiatives in the world don't mean anything if a kid is either hungry or jacked up on sugar. So I would love to see a way to, to really invest in this so that we don't have a deficit problem year from year. Mm -hmm. um, just, I should also mention that um, Peter Esposito and his assistant Brenda Franklin were at that. Um, hunger meeting that we went to. And we're just, tonight and the last couple of nights I've been thinking about food service has changed. It's different from, I mean, it was rare when I was in school that it was not until you were in high school that you could get breakfast. And that was just because they assumed high school kids were getting there late and you grab a yogurt on the way to your classroom. But now it really is becoming a more integral part of a student's day that that is where they eat two meals a day. Um, but I think you're right that there's an image problem with food service in schools in general that people uh, assume it is just junk food or, you know, not good for you <laughs> necessarily, but it's food. Um, so I had this idea I'm going to float by Peter, but I'm going to reveal it to you right now that I think <laughs> if we had once a quarter um, 
a community meal that is the food from food services that was at dinner time that people paid for, um, I think we could get a lot of people there and they would see the quality food and see that it is not the lunch that they might assume is happening every day. So, I mean, just making this up, obviously. I haven't talked to anybody about it. <laughs> but um, I think that is a way to overcome part of the PR issue with school lunch. So, anyway. do Are we ready to vote? Oh, Jackie. Uh, just a question that ki just came to my mind. The food deficit over override was not entirely due to meals. Is, is that what I heard you say, that there was some equipment that needed to be repaired and replaced? And well, the, the uh, food service program still came in under budget by $55,000. Correct. So you that's, that's the piece there that I want to emphasize. The food services program itself. 55,000 as opposed to 75,000 last year. And um, that's what I heard. Well, no, let, let me clarify. On the expenditure side, what they budgeted to spend, they did not spend all of it. But on the revenue side, they also did not receive all the revenue that they budgeted. So my question is, why was the equipment repair and or replacement in a total food services budget and not in maintenance? Well, typically if it's just an object for food service, like a mixer or an oven, um, we do share well, but if it's specifically for the food service program, we would typically put the expenditure in food service. Um, there have been times when something big has happened, like a walk-in refrigerator needed to be repaired. Um, and that would be in, in the maintenance side of things. But what we've done going forward, because this is kind of new to us as Peter came in and was looking around and saying, I need one of these and I don't have one of those right. and that one's broken, was to have him put together a, a real solid plan for what he had for assets, what he was going to need, what was old, what was going to need to be repaired. So in fiscal 17, we've actually budgeted equipment replacement in yeah. CIP which is a great place for it because it's typically where we would replace facilities, large-scale stuff everywhere. Well, I, I think the way that, it w that we received it, the way that I received it today uh, is skewed because it's maintenance, repair, replacement, I don't believe should be considered food services. And I, I'm glad to hear that you're going to separate the, still under the department, but there's food services and then there's whatever need, we need to have to support that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't include salaries under that total budget. The salaries are... Yeah, we do. So if you're a food service worker, your salary is paid from this food service budget. It's a completely separate fund. But Peter's it's, salary it's is designated. paid from there. In other words, it says yeah. salaries. Well, perhaps it would be helpful to have something that shows where the money was spent. Well, I think that's, I think that's important, not just for the school board, but for the public. Sure. Because if the sure. public hears that that budget is overspent by 200 whatever thousand dollars, it seems very excessive to me because you tell me 55 because the food costs more. That's one thing. And we know why because of the things that you just pointed out and, and that we just discussed about what the government requires and what we're able to charge and things of that nature. So. Uh, I just think it needs to be more de delineated mm. for public information. Thank you. Sure. I'll, I'll make a note that we can sort of break it out into categories and share that. Just to be clear, they came in under their expenditures even buying real food versus last year when they were, or two years ago when they were buying frozen food. Um, so the, the purchase of food 
is not any more expensive. They're, that's not causing them to go over budget. They're actually under budget with those items. Then I, I think we need to know exactly why there's a deficit. It's because of meals. I the understand revenue. that. I, I understand uh, that. And I've understood it ever since I've been on the school board because it's never been balanced. But I think there's a difference, as I said. I, I don't want to, you know, I've said my piece, and I just think it needs to be delineated. I'll see if I can't provide something that's a little more broken out for you. You don't have to do it now. I'm saying going forward mm. would be my suggestion. Well, sure. And, you know, with finance, we can talk about how to show things on those statements a little bit more uh, split out. Absolutely. Yeah, because as you say, I mean, if you... I'm thinking about the general fund. If you look at the general fund, it says we spent this on guidance and this on libraries and this on transportation but in food service it just says we spent this money so I, I see your point and we'll try to break that out a little bit anyone else okay all in favor six thank you okay we now are at 11.6 um, do we have a motion to approve the bargaining contract between the Scarborough Board of Education and Scarborough Education Association <laughs> I'm going to walk away. I want to make a motion and then we can have the discussion. Move approval. Second. Okay. Uh, yep, Jackie. My turn. Yep. This is a three year contract retroactive to September 1st, 2016 to August 31st. I put down the wrong date. 2019. 18. 19. 19. 19. 2019. See, I can't even type right. We worked through the spring and summer to reach this settlement that was achieved through interest-based bargaining. We were represented by Assistant Superintendent Joanne Sizemore and Kate Bolton, as well as our lawyer. Sitting with me from the board were Kelly Murphy and Christine Mazengill. Some of the highlights. Adjusted, we adjusted the staff meeting schedule in a way that adds six additional hours for professional development. Life insurance is still available, but will be paid for by the employee. Health insurance remains the same due su to substantial changes that were made during the previous negotiations and resulting in a cost savings to the district Pre-approved college courses paid at the USM rate will now be prepaid by the district directly to the institution. Should the employee fail to enroll, complete, or attain the required grade, the district will be reimbursed through payroll deduction. The total amount available for course reimbursement is determined annually through the budget process. Salaries. The board's aim during these negotiations was twofold, to retain our excellent teachers and to be competitive with our cohorts districts. To that end, as is typical in contract negotiations, the team took time to review our expiring salary tables in comparison with teacher compensation packages provided by other school districts in our labor market. As a result of this analysis, the agreed salary tables incorporate reworking of the steps in the existing tables overall to be competitive with surrounding districts. Addition of six steps at the top of each pay grade. The COLA of 0.5% in 2016-17. 1.5% in 2017-18 and 3% in 2018. This is important. We are facing teacher shortages, especially in this area, and was recently reported in the Bangor Daily News, as well as all the national news. 
As previously stated, we are competing with several districts for high quality, appropri appropriately certified teachers. And we want to recognize and reward our most dedicated teachers. Kelly uh, Murphy is going to be asking uh, Superintendent Kuchenberger to report on the impact of the contract at the next board meeting. In that report, we will hope to address both the budgetary impact in Scarborough and the context of the concern about attracting and retaining quality teachers in the face of the nationwide labor shortage. And to that end, uh, we are reviewing contracts from surrounding school districts to compare with our salaries. Thank you. Um, so to your point, Mr. Hartwell, I just wanted to let you know that we might not go over all those details today, but we are um, hopefully in the next meeting. And I think it would be important, not just financially, financially with um, Kate Bolton, but also with um, Monique Culbertson, their curriculum director, and um, I had somebody else's name I thought was going to be important too. Um, just to, because it's more than just finances, it's where we're going as a district and how um, our curriculum needs are being met um, by the teachers that we attract. So I think if it could be like a team presentation, I think that would cover a lot of um, the concerns that people have with a new new contract and it is the biggest contract and we recognize that so it impacts a lot of what um, how the school department runs for the next three years so anybody have uh, where approximately do you anticipate that we will be in terms of parity and equity with cohort schools at the end of these three years that information is being compiled as we speak. Uh, it could be finished, but it's being done in the superintendent's office. Uh, as I said, I think that, that uh, Mrs. Johnson has been gathering that information from other school districts for their most recent uh, contracts. <laughs> During negotiations, only about half of the cohort whom we were trying to, <coughs> whom we compete with, had existing contracts for this school year. In other words, they're in negotiations. If we look at their last year's contract, uh, we'd be just above midpoint. Just a little <coughs> bit above midpoint. But with their new contracts, we don't know. And that's the information that is currently being compiled. No, For the benefit of the general public, could could you all just briefly explain then how these percentage numbers were uh, derived? Um, just to further Jackie's point about um, we were not close <laughs> with our surrounding district. So it was South Portland, Kenny Bunk, help me out. Falmouth. Falmouth. Yarmouth? Yarmouth, South Portland. Greeley District. Greeley. Oh, yeah. Um, RSU, what is that? Uh, 50. Cumberland, 50. North Yarmouth. Um, 51. 51. And it was an agreed upon cohort that was suggested by um, the teachers. And then we looked at it and agreed. And they were all, or at least three of them, I think, were their contracts or had also expired and were in negotiations. So we have no idea where they're landing. Um, I don't know. Do you want Christine to talk about the percentages? Well, one of the point is that we... Our teachers still pay 20% of their health insurance premium. And almost every other school district around us, and we were amazed at this, have been increasing the, the percentage paid by the district. Some districts who are but us are paying 93% of the health insurance premium. And we have been, we have really stuck to our guns, and as we n mentioned in the last contract, we were able to negotiate a, a health insurance plan that saved the district hundreds of thousands of dollars, literally. And that's ongoing. That wasn't just a one-shot deal. That's ongoing. Mm -hmm. Christine, you want to talk about the finance um, aspect at all? Nope. No. I was not. <laughs> I was not prepared to do that. Okay. 
Um, I, I don't know, just to, as far as the specific percentages, we kind of just looked at where it would get us and um, that's where we landed. I mean, I don't know how else to say it, except it was like a full, almost a full day of doing the salary oh. negotiation, so. Looking at different tables and looking right. at different numbers that we'd gotten from Kate. And I mean, it was not derived at by saying, oh, gee, well, we think this sounds good. Yeah, it I wasn't know, like it's I think, all that, those I think other. that for some people hearing, you know, and again, there's a crystal ball element here, but yeah. I think that for some people hearing, we anticipate at the end of this that we'll be at roughly the 60th percentile yeah. of salary in our cohorts or whatever I'm that not, is. I'm not sure 60. we could say that right yeah. now. We would be happy to be there. We yeah, will not. We, we didn't even reach it. So, but I mean, that, I think it just sort of helps to justify the increase. Absolutely, and so for me personally, when we were talking about increases and how much and if and whatever, I think nothing that we hope to achieve as a school district happens without good teachers. So for me, it's a huge budgetary priority to pay the teachers, so they will stay, so they will come, so they won't leave. Um, we are finding that in the range of five to eight years is when we lose a lot of teachers. And if you look at the surrounding districts, their um, pay scale is much higher in that range. It's not surprising. If you can go to Portland and you can get 100% of your health insurance for you and your family covered, and they're paying more, I don't know why you teach in Scarborough, honestly, besides you just have a commitment to our town. So if we want to attract and retain dedicated professionals, loyalty can only go so far. I mean, they're here, it's their job. So, um, you know, there's been all these nationwide reports about how it's incredibly hard to find teachers, to keep teachers, and Maine is one of the most critical states for that right now. So in my opinion, we don't pay the teachers. What are we doing here? So that was kind of my marching orders for the day. I, I think you briefly just touched upon it, and, but I want to drive that point home, is um, paying the teachers not only to stay, but to attract them. We all know, we've all read the articles about how there's a teaching, a teaching shortage. So we need to, we're competing as a business, we're competing for those teachers to come to Scarborough rather than go to Portland where they can make a lot more health care for their, for their whole family. Those are important things to keep in mind, to retain good teachers, to attract great teachers. And, and the teachers that are coming out of school have a, already have that idea of where we're going based on curriculum, mm -hmm. which gets to the other point of why Monique might be a, an important part of that. They're already learning that way and so for them to come in, and I think we talked about it when we talked about technology, we, we lagged behind with technology when we had new teachers coming on board. It took them a long time to understand how to teach without the technology. And so we need to be providing the tools, whether it's what they're getting paid or the technology that they're using or the buildings that they're in and the classrooms that they are spending six hours a day teaching our children we need to be providing for them and and I think to always be focusing on what was the pay increase what was the pay increase takes away from what they're doing what the what we're asking of these teachers day in and day out who are spending six hours a day with our kids a lot of that many of those kids are probably spending more time than their parents are spending with them at home you know before school and after school these these people are critical in the development of future teachers or doctors or jobs that we don't know about yet so to always just be focusing on what was the percentage takes away from the rest of the information that's in here and just to, another thing to remember is, you know, Jackie alluded to, we had huge cost savings from our adjustments to the health insurance plan previously. So just to remind people, if somebody working in Scarborough schools has a uh, spouse that works someplace else that offers full insurance, they get insurance from their job, not from Scarborough. Um, we will insure 
partners that don't have insurance available at their job, but that's a big that's a big change. That was a big game changer for us. And um, do you have do you know how much? I just wanted to add on to that. We were probably one of the first school districts that yeah. did that, and many school districts have called to look at our plan because yeah. of the savings that we were able to achieve in the last contract. But we were one of the first school districts to implement that. We were the first school district to require to negotiate that that employees would pay a part of their health insurance to begin with. Scarborough was the first district in the state to do that umpteen years ago. And and we did it over three years. We started out at, at 90 percent, and then we went to 85, and then we went to 80. And we've been at 80 percent for a lot of years. Yeah. I know of another school district that negotiated that um, where if your spouse can get insurance in another district, but what they also negotiated was that their the district would pay 95 percent of their insurance. So we kept it at 80 yeah. percent, and if your spouse could um, obtain insurance with uh, their company, then they needed to do that. And honestly, every time we are negotiating the contracts and we're looking at what other districts pay for health insurance, we literally cannot figure out how they're doing it because they're increasing their portion and it's you never know where your bill's going to be for that so it's so volatile it's amazing um but we have been able to keep it at 80 and i think that is good for us sorry to we have an amazing you. staff here they they negotiate well there's no doubt about that but they're also concerned about the town they're also concerned about our students they want to work with us to improve education, and I think they prove that every day. They want to work with us. Do we have any other comments or discussion? Well, I have a letter from Donna that she sent bef um, the night before she left <laughs> on vacation, so I'll read it just so it's into the record. Um, Dear Vice Chair Kelly Murphy and school board members, since I'm unable to be with you this evening, I wanted to express my thoughts regarding the negotiated proposed teacher contract. As you are well aware, teachers today are experiencing a career that has increasingly been undergoing enormous changes since the No Child Left Behind Act, and particularly in the last five years. The role is now of not only pedagogy, but one of guidance, facilitation and expertise in the latest research in brain development, emotional awareness, and behavioral management of students. Teaching is still one of the least valued professions in our society, resulting in fewer and fewer candidates in college teacher education programs. 20% of teachers leave the profession by the end of the first year and almost half leave within five years. Yet a good education itself continues to be highly valued in our society as one that reflects accomplishment and the chance for a promising future. Maine educators today receive a pay scale that remains 36 in the nation, and this is from NEA data from 2014, and consistently last among other New England states. A teacher in our state will have to work well beyond 30 years in order to reach a salary of $70,000, which is a starting salary in many professions today. In my opinion, we must pay for what we value, and if we value education, then we must value our educators. If we expect to attract the teachers who will provide the level of quality education to our young people that we expect, then we must provide a competitive salary. Although I will not have a vote, I do support the proposed negotiated contract. I would like to thank our board's negotiations team for the many hours spent negotiating the contract. I have requested on behalf of the board that Superintendent Kuchenberger prepare some data to show the impact the proposed contract will have if indeed it is passed this evening. She's consented to do so at the next board meeting on October 20th. Respectfully submitted, Donna Bealey. So it seems like everyone agrees it would be good to have more information. <laughs> so, <Noted. laughs> so thank you for that. Um, and if there's nothing else, are we ready to take a vote? All in favor? Six. Thank, thank you. you. We look forward to next week. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. You have two weeks. I need to. <laughs> okay. And 12.0, do we have a motion? Move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Thank you. We are adjourned.